말씀은 갈라데아서 2장 11절부터 21절입니다. 먼저 11절부터 14절입니다. 그런데 개바가 안디옥에 왔을 때 잘못한 일이 있어서 나는 얼굴을 마주보고 그를 나무랐습니다. 그것은 개바가 야고보에게서 몇몇 사람이 오기 전에는 이방 사람들과 함께 음식을 먹다가 그들이 오니 할례받은 사람들을 두려워하여 그 자리를 떠나 물러난 일입니다. 나머지 유대 사람들도 그와 함께 위선을 하였고 마침내는 바나바까지도 그들의 위선에 끌려갔습니다. 나는 그들이 복음의 진리를 따라 똑바로 걷지 않는 것을 보고 모든 사람 앞에서 개바에게 이렇게 말하였습니다. 당신은 유대 사람인데도 유대 사람처럼 살지 않고 이방 사람처럼 살면서 어찌하여 이방 사람들어 유대 사람이 되라고 강요합니까? 바울은 베드로와 관련된 또 다른 에피소드를 우리에게 제공하고 있습니다. 율법에 의하면 할례받지 못한 이방 사람들과는 식사 자리를 가지면 안 됩니다. 그런데 사도행전 10장을 보면 베드로의 경우 고넬료 사건을 통해 유대인의 율법에 기록된 음식법에 대한 입장이 정리되었습니다. 그래서 베드로는 이방인 교회의 대표격인 안디옥에 와서 이방인 그리스도인들과 마음껏 함께 식사할 수 있었습니다. 그런데 야고보 쪽 사람들, 즉 예루살렘에서 온 유대인들을 보자 그들을 두려워하여 식사를 하다가 떠나버린 것입니다. 함께 있던 다른 유대인 그리스도인들도 모두 베드로처럼 식사 자리를 떠나는 지경에 이르렀습니다. 그러자 바울은 이런 베드로를 책망했습니다. 왜냐하면 이것은 자신이 믿는 복음의 진리를 떠나 사람들을 의식한 것이기 때문입니다. 바울이 지적하고자 한 것은 음식의 문제보다도 그들이 복음의 진리를 알고 있음에도 사람들의 눈을 의식했다는 것입니다. 이는 14절에서 베드로 보고 유대 사람처럼 살지 않고 이방 사람처럼 살고 있다고 말하는 부분에서 짐작할 수 있습니다. 베드로는 고넬료 사건으로 깨달음을 얻은 후 율법의 음식법을 잘 어기고 있었습니다. 그런데 유대인들이 오자 그들이 안디옥 교회에 문제를 일으킬까봐 두려워 식사자리를 떠나버린 것입니다. 반면 바울은 앞서 예루살렘에서 자신과 동행한 디도에게 할례를 행하려 하자 그것을 적극적으로 거부했습니다. 이런 점에서 자신과 대비되는 베드로의 비겁한 행동을 바울은 지적하고 싶었던 것입니다. 자신의 믿음과 다른 행동을 하는 것은 비겁한 행동이기 때문입니다. 당시 베드로와 함께 식사하던 이방인들에게도 이것은 나쁜 영향을 끼쳤을 것이기 때문입니다. 15절부터 18절입니다. 우리는 본디 유대 사람이요 이방인 출신의 죄인이 아닙니다. 그러나 사람이 율법을 행하는 행위로 의롭게 되는 것이 아니라 예수 그리스도를 믿는 믿음으로 의롭게 되는 것임을 알고 우리도 그리스도 예수를 믿은 것입니다. 그것은 우리가 율법을 행하는 행위로가 아니라 그리스도를 믿는 믿음으로 의롭다고 하심을 받고자 했던 것입니다. 율법을 행하는 행위로는 아무도 의롭게 될수 없기 때문입니다. 우리가 그리스도 안에서 의롭다고 하심을 받으려고 하다가 우리가 죄인으로 드러난다면 그리스도는 우리로 하여금 죄를 짓게 하시는 분이라는 말입니까? 그럴 수 없습니다. 내가 헐어버린 것을 다시 세우면 나는 나 스스로를 범법자로 만드는 것입니다. 더 나아가 바울은 자신이 베드로를 혼내게 된 근거를 추가적으로 설명합니다. 15절에서 우리란 바울과 베드로를 말합니다. 그들은 둘다 유대인입니다. 그런데 유대인인 그들조차도 율법을 지켜서 의롭게 된 것이 아니라고 말합니다. 바울은 사람이 예수 그리스도를 믿는 믿음으로 의롭게 되는 것이지 율법의 행위로 되는 게 아니라고 분명하게 말합니다. 여기서 의롭게 된다는 말은 구원받았다 또는 하나님의 자녀가 되었다 하나님 나라로 옮겨졌다는 말과 같습니다. 또한 여기서 예수 그리스도를 믿는다는 말은 예수님이 십자가에서 죽으시고 부활하셔서 우리를 구원하신 메시아라는 점을 믿는다는 말입니다. 그런데 여기서 주의할 점은 거짓 성경교사들이 갈라디아 교회의 성도들에게 예수님을 믿지 말라고 한 것은 아니라는 말입니다. 거짓 성경교사들이 예수님을 믿지 말고 율법을 행해야만 하나님 자녀가 된다고 말했다면 아마도 갈라디아 교회의 성도들은 결코 속지 않았을 것입니다. 그런데 그들은 예수님을 믿을지라도 율법까지 행해야만 온전한 하나님의 백성이 된다고 말했기에 갈라디아 교회의 성도들이 깜빡소가 넘어진 것입니다. 예수 믿는 것만으로는 부족하니 율법까지 덧붙여야 한다고 속인 것입니다. 바울은 17절에서 이방인들이 율법과 상관없이 예수 그리스도를 믿어 벌써 의롭다고 여겨졌는데 음식법이나 할례 같은 율법을 어겼다고 다시 죄인이 될 수는 없다고 말합니다. 그것은 마치 예수님이 우리를 죄짓게 만드시는 분이 되어버린 것입니다.
바울은 18절에서 우리가 율법으로 의롭게 되는 것이 아니라는 사실을 자신이 헐어버렸는데 그것을 다시 세우려 하는 것은 스스로를 범법자, 죄인으로 만드는 것이라고 설명합니다. 19절부터 21절입니다. 나는 율법과의 관계에서는 율법으로 말미암아 죽어버렸습니다. 그것은 내가 하나님과의 관계 안에서 살려고 하는 것입니다. 나는 그리스도와 함께 십자가에 못 박혔습니다. 이제 살고 있는 것은 내가 아닙니다. 그리스도께서 내 안에서 살고 계십니다. 내가 지금 육신 안에서 살고 있는 삶은 나를 사랑하셔서 나를 위하여 자기 몸을 내어주신 하나님의 아들을 믿는 믿음 안에서 살아가는 것입니다. 나는 하나님의 은혜를 헛되게 하지 않습니다. 의롭다고 하여 주시는 것이 율법으로 되는 것이라면 그리스도께서는 헛되이 죽으신 것이 됩니다. 이제 바울은 19절에서 이러한 구원의 진리를 비유적으로 표현합니다. 자신이 율법에 대해서는 죽은 것이고 하나님 안에서 사는 것이라고 말합니다. 이것은 율법이 더 이상 우리의 구원에 영향을 미치지 못한다는 말입니다. 바울은 하나님께 율법을 지키려는 노력으로 우리가 구원을 얻는 게 아니라는 것을 다시 한번 강조합니다. 우리는 오직 하나님의 아들을 믿는 믿음으로 구원을 선물로 받았습니다. 율법으로 가능한 일이었다면 아마도 바울은 예수님이 필요 없었을 것입니다. 왜냐하면 앞서 말한 것처럼 바울은 율법을 누구보다 열심히 지키는 열성 유대교 신자였기 때문입니다. 바울은 20절 21절을 통해 자신이 예수 그리스도께서 죽으실 때 자신도 함께 죽었다고 말합니다. 예수님이 십자가에서 죽으신 것은 우리의 죄를 뒤집어 쓰시고 율법의 저주로 인해 죽으신 것입니다. 율법은 죄를 저지른 자마다 저주 아래 놓이게 된다고 말하고 있기 때문입니다. 그래서 주님이 죽으실 때 죄인인 우리 역시 율법의 저주로 죽은 것과 같습니다. 그래서 이제 우리는 예수 그리스도의 은혜로 새 생명을 얻었다는 사실을 믿고 살아가는 것입니다. 오늘의 묵상 포인트입니다. 첫 번째, 주님은 우리를 사랑하셔서 새 생명을 주셨습니다. 죄인에게 주시는 일방적인 은혜입니다. 율법으로 정죄하는 대신 자신을 희생하신 사랑으로 우리를 구원해 주셨습니다. 이렇게 은혜로 구원받은 사람은 율법을 가지고 남을 정죄하고 비난할 권리가 없습니다. 오직 용서하고 사랑할 의무만 남습니다. 두 번째, 복음의 진리가 상황에 따라 달라져서는 안 됩니다. 베드로는 복음의 진리를 따라 이방 사람과 격없이 식탁교제를 했지만 유대 사람들 앞에서는 그 일을 부끄러워했습니다. 믿음의 고백과 행동이 교회 안에서만 유효한 것은 아닌지 돌아 봅시다. 내 신앙을 감추고 위선적인 모습이 있지는 않은지 스스로를 돌아 봅시다. 나의 기도입니다. 주님, 오직 구원은 주님의 은혜로 주어진 선물임을 깨닫습니다. 제가 행한 모든 일은 그 은혜에 대한 마땅한 반응일 뿐입니다. 자랑할 수도 없고 내세울 수도 없습니다. 죄로 인해 율법의 조주를 받아 죽어 마땅한 인생에게 주님은 새 생명을 주셨습니다. 그 은혜로 날마다 살아가는 제가 되게 해주십시오. 예수님 이름으로 기도드립니다. 아멘
would turn with me in your copy of God's Word as we turn to this morning's sermon. Turn with me to the book of Galatians in the New Testament, an epistle of the Apostle Paul, Galatians, and we find ourselves this morning in chapter 4, beginning chapter 4 together. Galatians chapter 4, and this morning we want to focus on verses 1 through 11. Let us hear the Word of God. Galatians 4, beginning in verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, we... When we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Amen. Let us pray briefly and seek God's help one final time as we come to the preaching of His Word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we pray that You would break now for us the bread from heaven. We pray, Lord, that you would reveal Christ to us by your Spirit, that we would, as children of God, know the greatness, the greatness that surpasses even our own understanding of the blessings that you've bestowed upon us in your Son. Lord, that you would free our hearts to worship you, that we would give thanks, that we would bear well under tribulation, because we know in our hearts that you have brought us out of the family of the devil, out of slavery and bondage to sin, and you have made us free sons in your Son, the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that we would know even that blessed work of your Spirit in the heart of the believer that cries out with our hearts to address you as Abba, Father. Lord, that we would as your people know the nearness and the intimacy with which you have brought us near to yourself through the gospel. Lord, we do pray this morning, if there are any who are here who are strangers to the gospel, and who are yet in the family of Adam, in the family of the devil, Lord, we pray that you would awaken them to the reality of their sins, the reality of their own bondage, and that, Lord, you would free their hearts by your grace, to trust the Lord Jesus for freedom and for sonship. Lord, do this for your glory, we pray. We pray that you would encourage the hearts of the saints. Lord, may we rejoice together as we meditate upon and ponder the glories and the truths that are revealed in this passage of Scripture. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you feed us by your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would Uh, Give us more of an appetite to know the things that you have given to us freely. Lord, help us, we pray. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we've been making our way through the book of Galatians, we've seen how the Christian gospel is in many ways like a multifaceted diamond, which as you turn this diamond, you begin to see distinct blessing after blessing. Uh, The gospel brings us 
uh, a complete Christ who meets the sinner's every need. And the main angle, the main facet of this diamond that Galatians zooms in on is the Christian's justification that Christ changes our status as legally guilty and condemned criminals before God to the new status of righteous in Christ, right? This is the courtroom scene, the legal scene in which Christ takes my filthy robes off of me, the offender, and he gives to me his robe of righteousness. But then if you turn the diamond again, you soon discover that the gospel gives us not only a new record in heaven, which is glorious and magnificent, but it also gives us a new heart on earth. Our hearts, which were full of impurity and enslaved to sin, are through the gospel made alive to God by the Spirit of Christ in order that we might now love God and delight in the beauty of holiness. It's what we call our sanctification. Paul opened it up at the end of chapter 2. But there's another wonderful facet of this diamond, and it's one that I'm convinced is far too often overlooked. In fact, some theologians have called it the pinnacle blessing of our union with Christ, namely our adoption as sons of God. And it's tragic that this blessing is often overlooked because adoption is often spoken of in the New Testament as comprehending the entirety of our salvation. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 5, God predestined us unto adoptions as sons. Uh, that, that's a summary way of uh, comprehensively encompassing all of the blessings that we have in Christ. It is that we have been predestined unto the adoption as sons. In Christ, we are given a full membership into a new family. We are adopted out of the family of the devil, which was marked by slavery to sin, which led us to being alienated from God, separated from God. There was a, an infinite chasm between us and gone, and though formerly enemies, we are ushered into the very inner chambers of the household of God as full-fledged members. Uh, Jesus gives a wonderful picture of this doctrine. You remember the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, in which this son who has absolutely, literally drug his father's name uh, through the mud you remember, returns to his father and he says to himself, he says, I know that I'm no longer to be called my father's son, but father, would you merely make me one of your slaves? And you remember the father's response. The father's response is to say, that's nonsense. Bring the robe, put the ring upon him, kill the fatted calf and let us celebrate for my son who was dead is alive again. That's the goal of the gospel. Uh, the gospel does not stop at forgiveness and holiness, but those blessings terminate on an intimate, near closeness with God, where he now owns us as his beloved sons. He puts his name upon us. We, have, we are given access to the throne of grace with boldness, and we are enabled, as Paul says, to cry out, Abba, Father. Now, the Galatians had experienced this. Uh, though they had been previously pagan Gentiles, remember the Galatians are Gentiles, they're not Jewish, they had been previously enslaved to idolatry and false worship, and yet through the gospel that Paul preached, they had been liberated into sonship with the true and living God. They had been made heirs of the privileges and the liberties of the gospel. But now, you remember the context of the letter, the occasion of the letter, they are like foolish sheep, foolishly wandering out of the green pastures of the gospel and are looking for greener grass elsewhere. In particular, they're following the Judaizers, false teachers, and they're wandering back into the old covenant law with its regulations, thinking that maybe by these things they could earn their way into a better position with God. And you remember particularly uh, according to the Judaizers, the first regulation was circumcision. But we see here in verse 10, it wasn't just circumcision. You notice Paul says, you, ob you observe days and months and seasons and years. Uh, th those are all referring to Jewish uh, elements of worship. 
And the point is, the Galatians are returning to the slavery of trying to work for God and seeking to earn their sonship by the works of the law instead of enjoying the sonship they already possess by grace through faith. And the Apostle Paul speaks very passionately to them. We do not find freedom through the works of the law because the law enslaves. We find true freedom by believing in the one who was born under the law in order to set us free from the curse of the law so that we can now serve God not as a slave seeking to gain his freedom, but as an adopted beloved son who has been set free. And Christian, professing Christian, this passage poses a question to all of us about our Christianity. Do you honestly in your heart of hearts know the freedom and the liberation that's found in the gospel? Has the Son set you free? Is your religion one of delighting in the Father because of His Son so that you serve Him with familial love and joy? Or is your religion one of mere drudgery, bondage, that feels more like relating to God as a slave than as a son. This passage, the outline is really simple. Paul, um, it basically just unfolds itself for us. Paul essentially takes us as Christians on a journey of our own experience. He describes first what we were prior to being united to Christ by faith. We were slaves. And then he describes what God in his grace did for us in that condition to free us. And then finally and thirdly, he describes what we are now because of what God has done. Namely, we are sons. And so those are the three movements I want to consider this passage under. First of all, let's consider our former slavery in verses 1 through 3 and 8 and 9. Our former slavery. Uh, Paul describes here our slavery, our transition from slavery to sonship in two ways. First, by means of giving a human analogy and then by applying that analogy to us. And uh, this illustration given in verses 1 and 2, probably to our modern American ears, sounds somewhat perplexing. Um, but we need to know, Paul is pulling here, he's dipping into here, a well-known cultural practice that would have been well-known in his day, the adoption of a male heir into a family. Uh, let's read verses in one, 1 and 2 again together. He says, Now I say that the heir as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is the master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Now, it seems that Paul is drawing mostly from Roman culture here. There might be some uh, Greco-Roman culture mixed in here. You can read the debates and the commentaries yourself. But in the Roman world, and we, we actually have famous historical examples of this happening uh, this usually happened to families that were very wealthy and had large estates and a large inheritance they needed to pass down, that if these families were unable to produce a natural son to be the heir, then they would adopt a male from another household and he would be taken into the adoptive family to eventually become the heir of the estate. And obviously, the father of this estate wanted time to be able to groom his heir and train the child. And so this would often happen, uh, this adoption would all often happen when the child was young. Um, and there would be an appointed time, as Paul says here, that was set by the father for when this child will no longer be considered merely a child, but he will enter into the full inheritance of his father's estate. Okay, hope you're following that thus far. But while the child is an, or excuse me, while the heir is a child, Paul is saying, and the word used here is the word napios, it can mean infant, it can just mean young child. Either way, Paul's point is that this young child is not of age, and uh, the time appointed by the father hasn't yet come to pass, and uh, therefore I think the word minor captures the idea, while the heir is a minor. But Paul says, while the heir is a child, he does not differ from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Right? So you think about it from a very practical perspective. The heir's status in the household doesn't differ when he's young from that of a slave. Uh, he makes no decisions for himself. 
Uh, He has no freedom, though he is destined to one day enter into his freedom as an heir. Uh, In fact, verse 2, Paul says he's under guardians and he's under stewards. Uh, These would have been the people that were appointed to train and raise the child. Um, As you can imagine, the father of of a large estate was usually preoccupied with the business of the estate, and uh, so there are guardians put over the child. And this would be the case until the time appointed by the father. The father was the one who chose the year in which he judged that the heir has come to maturity and that the son, it's now time for him to become a full heir. And it's very fascinating. You can read some of the historical background on these things. The things that would happen on that day when the child uh, puts off being a child and enters into full adulthood. He would take off his robe of childhood and he would put on for the first time uh, the robe of of manhood. Uh, On that day, he would become an official Roman citizen and there would be all sorts of festivities and they would offer sacrifices to the gods and things like that. But it's on that day that the child has come out from being under the guardians and stewards. He's no longer a child. He's no longer like a slave in the house, but he has come of age and he's now entered into full sonship. Now, that's the analogy Paul gives. Now, how does he apply that analogy to us in verse 3? Look at verse 3. And we have to follow Paul somewhat closely here. He says, even so we... Right? So he's speaking of Christians, Jewish and Gentile. Even so, we, when we were children, right? He's not just talking about when we were really, you know, in our infancy or whatever, in our actual experience. He means before we had come into our inheritance in Christ, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. So just as the child in that analogy was like a slave in that he was under guardians and stewards, We were slaves prior to being in Christ to what Paul calls the elements of the world. Now, I think there are at least two senses in which Paul is applying this analogy. This is where I say you've got to think with me for a second. There's two senses in which Paul is applying this analogy. Their inheritance going back to being a slave in the house. That would be like going from freedom to bondage. Because you remember, that's what the law does. The law brings bondage. It brings condemnation. But then there's secondly, the second application has to do with their personal experience. Okay, so this is the second application of the analogy. The child in this analogy, being in this house, doesn't just refer to Jews who were in bondage under the period of the law, but rather it refers to every sinner's experience, both Jew and Gentile, prior to knowing God savingly in Christ. We were, in other words, according to According to Paul here, all of us in bondage. Notice, jump over to verses 8 and 9 of chapter 4. Uh, he's speaking here, remember, to Gentiles. These are people who had never been under the law of Moses. They were not the covenant people of, of God like Israel was. And yet, notice in verses 8 and 9, Paul says that they too were in bondage in the same way. He says in verse 8, but then, or, or you might have the ESV that says, I think, formerly, but then indeed, When you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you again desire to be in bondage? Now, that word elements there is the same exact word Paul used in verse 3, right? The elements of the world. He is saying Gentiles as well were in bondage to the elements and they were, again, the foolishness of the Galatians, desiring to go back to be in bondage to these things that they've been freed from. This is very, very practical for us as Christians. It's very important, I think, for us to, from time to time, remember and look back upon where we came from. Every Christian in this room, if you know Christ savingly, Prior to that glorious day in which Christ came to you in his gospel and the Spirit liberated you, opened your eyes, liberated you into the freedom of the children of God, every single one of us were in various ways enslaved to the elements of the world. doesn't matter who you are, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, 
uh, male or female, child or adult, all of us prior to knowing God were shackled spiritually to our slave master, sin. We were deceived and yet thinking we weren't deceived. Right? Romans 1, professing to be wise, what? We became fools. Um, we worshipped the creature rather than the creator. We worshipped ourselves. We chased after idols. Might have been the idols of drugs, fornication, uh, worldly ambition and pride. We worshipped ideologies and philosophies that were foolish. And we told ourselves it was freedom when in truth it was bondage. I've talked to many of you. I've had the pleasure of talking and getting to know many of you recently and hearing your testimonies. Some of you have been uh, going through your, your membership interviews and I'm hearing your testimonies. And time and time again, there is the consistent theme in a true Christian's testimony. When you look back to what you were apart from Christ, and you don't just think, right? The person indwelt by the Spirit of God doesn't just think, yeah, you know, I had a little blemish here and there. But they look back and they realize, I was mastered by sin. I didn't just dabble with sin, I loved sin. And I thought I could see, but I was blind. I was a child of the kingdom of darkness. That's how the New Testament describes us. We are children of wrath. We're children of the devil. Uh, to be outside of Christ, whether Jew or Gentile, is to be in bondage to Satan and this world. Um, I think we forget that when we think about unbelievers. Um, that is the testimony of every biblical author of the New Testament. Jesus himself said, John chapter 8, whoever commits sin is what? The slave of sin. Uh, the Apostle John says, 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies under the sway of the evil one. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the God of this age, speaking of the devil, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. This was all of us. We were all by nature children of another family, and the staggering part is we didn't even want escape. Ephesians 2, we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and what does Paul say we were doing? following the prince of the power of the air. That's again a reference to the devil, right? We were willing followers in the kingdom of darkness. Uh, we, we loved the warmth of the womb of darkness. We were in bondage. But that's not where this passage ends. It's one of those glorious but God uh, uh, things that Paul does here occasionally. But God... And that brings us to the second thing that we want to see here, and it's at the heart of this text. We have to first see the bad news, and now we want to see the glorious news of grace. So that's what we were. We were slaves. And now we want to see, secondly, what God did. What God did for us in verses 4 and 5. And Paul gives here, I think, one of the greatest summaries of Christ and his work. Um, verse 4. If you look at verse 4, he says, But when the fullness of the time had come, now just pause there for a second, right? Thinking back to the analogy in verses 1 and 2, this is the time appointed by the Father, right? The fullness of when the fullness of time had come. The Father is in control here. Uh, this phrase speaks of the sovereign purpose of God in executing redemption exactly, not only how He pleases, but exactly when He pleases. Uh, Ephesians 1.10 speaks of the fullness of the times, plural, when God sums up all things in Christ. God is the Lord of history, and Christ is the centerpiece of history. Christ is the main event. Um, God did not just kind of willy-nilly on, on a whim decide one day, you know, I guess today is as good a day as any <laughs> to send forth my son into this world. No, the time for the Son to come into the world had been appointed by the Father from before the foundation of the world, and literally every single atom and molecule and event up until that point existed for the purpose of bringing Christ into the world. History revolves around Christ and His salvation. It was the fullness of times, and I, I would love to pause and open up practically what that means. I'll just mention a few. That means when the law 
had completed doing, when it had finished doing its cruel condemning work, right? That's what the purpose of the law was, was to prepare Israel, to show Israel there's no hope of us gaining righteousness by obedience. We need to look to the promise. So when the law had run its course and prepared the people, um, when all of the Old Testament types and shadows had been put in place that explained the kingdom of Christ, Right? You think of the sacrificial system, uh, the kings of Israel, the kingdom, uh, the exiles, all of these things. When the Gentiles had been allowed to walk in darkness as strangers to the covenants of promise, when all of that prep work had been done, then God sends forth His Son into the world. The table had been set exactly as God, as God wanted it set. The stage had been prepared. And now God says it's time for my son and his gospel to go into all the world to redeem his brothers. Notice how Paul describes the coming of the son. He says, God sent forth his son born of a woman. I think sometimes we overlook this, but this is an affirmation. Paul just assumes it, but it's an affirmation of the son's eternality and the son's uh, deity. If, If you notice, it does not say that the Son came into existence in the fullness of time, but rather that in the fullness of time, God sent His Son to be born of a woman. Right? To be sent to be born of a woman, you have to pre-exist being born of a woman. And so Christ is sent born of a woman. That's the phrase Paul uses. Now, what does that mean? Well, simply put, it means the Son came in human flesh. Uh, I I don't think primarily Paul has in mind here the virgin birth when he just emphasizes woman. He's emphasizing, it's a phrase that was often used in Hebrew, to be born of woman is to be a man. Um, He came to be the God-man, not ceasing to be what he had always been, right? God cannot cease to be God, but taking to himself a human nature, like us in every respect with the exception, the one exception of sin. Now, let me pause for a second. You might be here, you might be new to Christianity, and you're thinking to yourself, what a strange thing to believe. Why would the Son of God, if there is such a God, why would the Son of God need to become a man like us? Hebrews 2, verse 17 answers that question. The author says, in all things, Christ had to be made like his brethren. Why? in order that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. If guilty men like us are to be redeemed, we must be redeemed by one like us. If God is going to provide a substitute that stands in the stead and in the place of uh, a condemned sinner so that he can be condemned in our place, he has to be one of us, right? Uh, Hebrews, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, right? The animal sacrifices of the Old, te- uh, old Covenant did not take away the sins of the people. Uh, a bull or a goat cannot stand in the place of a human. The wages of sin is death, and God cannot die. The divine nature cannot die. And so God, what? Must be made man to be able to become a curse for us. And yet, he also had to be fully God so that his death would be of infinite value. So that the blood that Christ sheds on the cross is not just the blood of a mere mortal, but as Paul says in Acts 20, one of the most glorious statements that Paul makes, I think, that God purchased the church with his own blood. The blood of Christ is the blood of God. He comes as a man born of a woman And then Paul adds a second qualifier, born under the law. This is what we call Christ's active obedience. Uh, It's a very, very crucial doctrine for the Christian to understand. Christ's active obedience. Um, And I've mentioned this several times before. I hope as a church we're starting to grow more in our uh, being able to articulate these things and understand them and why they're important for the Christian life. You think back to the covenant of works God made with Adam in the garden. God gave a law to Adam that had he obeyed it, it would have earned him eternal life, right? That was the arrangement in the garden. But we know Adam disobeyed and therefore incurred what? The curse 
of death. And all of us, because we're born of Adam, we share that inheritance from Adam. And so I, as a sinner in Adam, I need two things, don't I? If I'm to be an heir of God and an heir of eternal life. I need, first of all, the forgiveness of my transgressions, right? I have a bad record before God. I need my failures and my debits to be paid, uh, to be discharged. And that's what Christ, what we call his passive obedience, accomplished for me. In his death, not passive in the sense that he was unconscious or anything, but passively in the sense that he, in my place, received the punishment due for my transgression. But here's the thing. The gospel's even better than that. Because Christ didn't only die for me, Christ lived for me. He was born under the law so that he can obey the law in my stead and thus merit the inheritance for me. If if Christ only died for me, I would be forgiven, which would be great, but I wouldn't be righteous. I wouldn't wouldn't have a right to the heir of being the, uh, the inheritance of heaven. And so... Christ comes and he fulfills the mission of obedience that his father gave to him. You, especially the Gospel of John, it is just, it's peppered all over. Jesus is constantly saying things like, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Or John 4, um, he says, it's my food to do the will of him who sent me. Christ comes being obedient even to the point of death, so that when I as a sinner trust Christ, it is his very righteousness I receive. His cross takes away my curse and his obedience secures my right to heaven. All of this, okay, follow me, verse 5, is so that, and I've already gotten ahead of myself here, verse 5, all of this so that he might redeem those who were under the law. That's the purpose, of, or one of the purposes of the incarnation. Christ comes as one like us in our flesh, but unlike us in our sin, so that he can step into the role as our sinless substitute to redeem us from the curse of the law. How? By becoming a curse for us. And hopefully you have bells going off in your mind, uh, reminding you of chapter 3, verse 15, that we looked at a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's the same exact word used in both places. It's a unique word. I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, ex agarazzo. Uh, it, that's the word for redeem. It, uh, it comes from the context of the slave market in Paul's day. And if you were a slave in Paul's day, in order to be redeemed, you had to be purchased. Uh, people didn't just set you free. And on occasion, it's quite rare, a slave could purchase his own freedom if he somehow came into money. But more often, another owner would come and would buy him from his present owner to free him from his former master so that he could now uh, belong to this new master. But Christ redeems us, not from earthly slavery, but from slavery to sin and the elementary principles of this world and the wrath of God. We have to understand we're talking about an infinitely more severe slavery here. That kind of redemption can only be accomplished not with things of this world, not with gold and silver, but only by Christ offering his own precious blood to the Father in our place. If someone possessed the entire world, without exaggeration, it would not be a gift sufficient enough to suffice even to pay the debt for a single sin to God. Uh, It could not for a moment satisfy or pacify the infinite wrath of an infinitely holy God. Our redemption required an infinite payment, the blood and life of God's only Son. And such is the worth of Christ's sacrifice that it didn't just pay for one sin. It didn't just pay for one man's sins, but Hebrews 10, 14 says, For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. It's an eternal redemption. Christ steps into our shackles and trades places with us to purchase our freedom. That's We could stop here and sing again. And can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me?
But Paul goes on, and it gets even better here. It's like a crescendo, Paul's whole argument. It goes from bad to incredible to even more incredible. He doesn't just free us from slavery, but the second half of verse 5, he frees us that we might receive the adoption as sons. And that's the third thing, the third movement that I want to consider, our, our final movement here. What we are now in Christ, namely sons of God. Paul writes, verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Let me give you a short aside. I uh, heard a pastor tell the story of how he was in a man's home uh, one day. It was one of his church members, and uh, he was doing some pastoral oversight with the man, and they were talking. And while they were talking, discussing, you know, in the front room of the house, suddenly uh, a boy walked into the house who had been away at boarding school for, for months. And the boy walked in and he turned to this man that was meeting with the pastor and he said, hello, sir. And the, the man said, ah, oh, hello, welcome back. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you a bit later. And the boy walked onto his room and uh, the man turned back to the pastor and proceeded to tell the pastor, that was my son. And the pastor didn't say anything inwardly, or excuse me, didn't say anything uh, outwardly, but inwardly was distressed. That, that's your son? And that's how you greet him after being apart from him for months? You don't even get up from your chair? He calls you sir? I mean, if, what kind of a greeting is that for a son to his father? That's not how fathers greet their children. That's how fathers greet strangers. Fathers run to their children. They, they pick their children up. They kiss their children. And they say, good to see you, son. I've missed you so, so much. They embrace their children, and their children know the warmth of fatherly love towards them. That is the picture of the Father's love for us that Paul paints here in Galatians 4. And I think as Christians, to, to our own detriment, um, in our walk with God, our, this is an element of the Christian life that we do not think about as often as we should. Um, our relationship with God has not just gone from being enemies to now no longer enemies. It's gone from being enemies to now beloved sons. Our alienation from God that led to slavish fear has changed now to one of intimacy and freedom so that we can, as God's people say with John, 1 John 3, 1, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Christian, I want to ask you, does that truth permeate your life? When you rise from your bed in the morning, uh, when you hit your bed in the evening, uh, when you go to work, when you parent, is the banner in your heart, waving over your heart, one that says, I am privileged to serve God today as his child. Uh, God desires his children to know his love for us and our access to him. And he, he wants us to know this such that he's built it even to the very way we pray. Right? How has Jesus taught his disciples to pray? He does not teach us to pray dear man upstairs, or my higher power. He teaches the church to pray, our Father, our Father, my Father who loves me and takes care of me. I mean, you want motivation to serve God, to be joyful, to be content, to be kind, to live a different way? What a motivation than to know that the Son had your name engraved upon His palms and now stands before the Father and brings you near as a son. I'll go further. Um, we actually grieve the heart of God when we as His children act like we just don't know if He really loves us. Um, God has done everything He can to demonstrate His love for us. He's given literally the best of the best. Uh, I, want, I want you to notice here, so I think it's, we miss it a lot, the double sending that Paul mentions here in Galatians 4. Look at verse 4. Um, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. 
born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, right? That's infinite love in itself, that God would send his son, Romans 5. Um, In this, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But verse 6 of Galatians 4, look at it. God does something even more. There's a second sending. And because you are sons, God has sent forth, it's the same exact word, the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. If the sending of the Son was not enough, God has sent His Holy Spirit, who here is called the Spirit of the Son, And he sent the Spirit where? Into our hearts. The nearest that God could get to us, right? The Spirit, we could go to John 14 and 15 and 16, the Upper Room Discourse. One of the ministries of the Spirit is to bring Christ and the Father's love near to us. Notice the nature of his ministry here, according to Paul. What does the Spirit do in our hearts? He cries out. It's, it's an earnest, loud cry. God would cry. He cries out with our hearts, Abba, Father. You remember Jesus in the Upper Room Discourse promised his disciples that it was for their benefit that he'd go away because he would send the Comforter? This is a part of that comforting ministry of the Spirit in the Christian's life and how we should bless God for this ministry of the Spirit. Paul says in Romans 8, 15, parallel text, you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. And then Paul says this in verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The spirit is an advocate in our own hearts. And the picture is this, if you piece together Paul's you know, the different things he says in different places. Not only does the Son of God, Christ, sit at the hand of the Father as our advocate in heaven, making intercession for us, but the Spirit of Christ makes intercession and advocates in our own hearts that we are the children of God, inwardly assuring us and persuading us that just as Jesus addressed God as Abba Father, which he did in Mark 14, 36. In the same way, we as his adopted brothers are invited into that same nearness. That the, lover, that the Father loves us as he loves his Son. That's, that's the message of this passage. The Gospel brings us not only forgiveness, not only holiness, but it brings us as near to God as we could ever be. And that therefore all other paths lead to bondage rather than freedom. I want to close this morning with two applications, speaking to two different groups of people. I want to first of all speak to the Christian, and then secondly to the non-Christian. First of all, an application for us as believers, as Christians. I want to plead with you, Christian, live and serve God as liberated sons. Live and serve God as liberated sons. This is Paul's burden for the Galatians. Uh, make no mistake, you might be here for the first time in Galatians, and if all you ever, if you just poke into the middle of one of Paul's letters and you see how he speaks negatively about the law, you might think Paul doesn't want them to obey God, you know, it's just grace, grace, grace. Don't make that mistake. Paul wants them to obey God, he wants them to serve God and keep his commandments. The problem is they're doing it for horrible motives. They're doing it from a terrible place in terms of how they're relating to God. They are serving God as though they are mercenaries. Um, We are not mercenaries, brothers and sisters. We are sons who serve God not out of slavish fear or as those who would try to earn a right place with Him, but as those who have already been seated in the heavenly places with Christ. Uh, We serve God from the motivation of free grace and acceptance with God, um, to love God. Uh, Love for for the Father and His love for us should permeate every single one of our deeds. Not a slavish fear that if I 
slip up here, God's going to reject me. But as a son wanting to please our Father, Galatians 5.6, Paul says, for in Christ Jesus, not circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Jeremiah Burroughs, a Puritan, said, do all that you do out of love. Do not be a mercenary. He said, a servant does not care to do anything further than what he may be paid for. But a child does not do so. He does what he does out of love. We now live in the world, first and foremost, in the gaze of our loving Heavenly Father. A Father who is never absent from us. A Father who sees all. And the Son who genuinely loves His Father fears above all else, what? The frown of His Father. He fears offending His Father. The Son says, I dare not do this because He does not want to make uh, he does not want to disappoint his father. Remember that, Christian, in temptation, as you live the Christian life. I think perhaps we don't fight sin often enough with the motivation of God's love. We often think of other motivations. But God's love for us and our sonship is the foundation which woos our hearts again to God to render to him the service we owe him. That brings us secondly to the non, non-Christian I want to speak to you this morning if you're here and you're not believing the gospel. My heart uh, breaks for you because you know nothing of this love of a father. Uh, my heart breaks because there might be some this morning who sit under the means of grace. You might even be a member of Bethany Baptist Church and you hear sermon after sermon about the freedom of the gospel and you yourself have never embraced the gospel. You come to church, but you've never come to Christ. You need to know it does not matter your proximity to the church. It does not matter if you're near and around the things of the kingdom of God. If you are not yourself a partaker of Christ by faith, you remain a child of the devil in bondage. And the only inheritance you have, child of Adam, is the inheritance of wrath and hell. And you need to do that. As an unbeliever, God is a gracious God, gracious beyond our comprehension and our understanding. And yet, He is a just God who loves His Son and He will punish all who spurn the gift of His Son. From the totally outright irreligious person who just outright rejects the need of grace, I don't need God's help, I've I've got this all taken care of, all the way down to the person who looks really clean on the outside and sits in church and gives lip service to grace and yet in their heart of hearts is depending on themselves. All of them need to come to Christ. You need to come to Christ. Leave behind the family of Adam. Leave behind the family of Satan and by free grace be promoted to the glorious status of a child of God. You think about the offer of the gospel. It's an invitation to leave the slave camp. Uh, It's an invitation to give up the swine trough of drudgery and bondage to sin and to come as a welcomed guest into the very house of the Father's love. Remember Jesus' words, Matthew 11, speaking to those of his day who were burdened by the law, were burdened by their inability to actually keep the law in order to be made right with God. And what does he say to them? He says, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden. That's what the Galatians were doing. They were trying to labor again for God. And Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Jesus himself, through the preaching of his gospel, offers you the forgiveness of your sins a new heart, and the glorious status as a son of God and heir of the world to come, if you would but look to him in your heart by faith. If you know in yourself, I have nothing by which to commend myself to God. I have nothing that I can give to him to make him reward me with the gift of righteousness. And therefore, I throw all of that aside. And with empty hands, I cling to Christ.
I cling to His cross. I cling to His obedience because Him and Him alone can represent me before the Father as a son. Trust Christ. Come to Christ. You might be a false professor that everyone around you thinks you're a Christian and you look the part and you play the part, but in your heart of hearts, you're looking to yourself. There is grace for hypocrites. There is grace for the outright sinner. All of us need to look to Christ and find freedom from sin. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would cause us to look to Christ in our hearts. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for these magnificent promises of sonship. That even right now, though we have not come into the fullness of our inheritance... Even right now, we have the privilege of being called the children of God. Lord, we thank you that you have sealed us for the day of redemption. That you've given us your blessed spirit. The spirit of your son who is the down payment for our final inheritance that's being kept for us and we for it. We thank you that you've given the gift of your son who now sits at your right hand. Who pleads for every one of his people the merits of His work, that we would not be lost. Lord, we thank You for the security the Gospel gives the sinner. We know that if we were to look for a moment to ourselves, to our own obedience, Lord, that is such shaky ground to stand on. That is sinking sand. But when we look to Christ, we see that we cannot be lost. Lord, we thank You that You have done for us what the law could not do what we could not do by keeping the law, by sending your Son in the likeness of human flesh, that he might be condemned in our place, receive the adoption as sons. Lord, we pray that you would go with us this Lord's Day, that you would write your word on our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would help us, that you would help us to walk in the freedom of being children of God, that we would obey you, that we would be even more careful to obey you, because we are not slaves but your beloved sons. Lord, we pray that you would cause your smile and your delighting in us to be the thing that rules in our hearts, that we would remember your eye is always upon us and that we should always endeavor to serve you and to live for your glory. Lord, help us, we pray. Draw near to us, we ask. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. or some type of event that basically there's the transformation from childhood to adulthood. In the Jewish culture, it's a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. That when a boy or a girl gets around 12 or 13, they have a special time. A bar mitzvah means the son of the covenant, the son of the commandments. That now they're going to, they're like an adult and now they're responsible. In the early years of our country, we've talked about this before, that boys didn't wear long pants, they wore knickers. But when they considered, they got considered to be an adult, they wore long pants. Well, today there's an event that happens that when a child becomes an adult or when they think they become an adult, and that's when they get their driver's license. See, as we think about Paul, realize that he's going to be talking about the culture that they were in. And how did a child become an adult? What made that person that way? It deals with their clothes, and we'll see it this morning as we go through chapter 4, as Paul continues to show that salvation is a gift simply by faith, that being under the law, you're a minor. That's what he talks about. But being under grace, 
You're an adult, full-grown son, and we'll see it as we go through it. Well, let's think about it. As we move to chapter 4, we realize we call this what's known as a swing chapter. That means he's still dealing with the issue of salvation as a gift by faith in Christ, but he begins to talk about the Christian life in this one. And he's going to say the same thing, that the Christian life is a walk of faith. He said it back in chapter 2 when he talked about in verse 20 where he had been crucified with Christ. Let no longer I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. And so the Christian life is, this, is living the same way that we have eternal life. Eternal life comes by faith. Christian life is a walk of faith. He is stressing those things, especially as we get into chapter 4. He's going to use an illustration from their culture to help them understand the contrast between being under bondage to law and being under freedom and grace. And he's going to make a contrast between a slave and a son. Under law, they're slave and bondage. Under grace, you're a son and you're free. Remember that in chapter 3, and we just finished that, Paul gave six reasons why salvation was by faith and not by works. As we go into chapter 4, he's going to deal with some of the same issues, but he's going to begin the Christian life aspect. Let me just show you the chapter. You don't have to write any of this down or anything. But in the first 11 verses, he talks about the contrast between a minor child and a full-grown son. We're going to talk about that today. Then Paul reminds the Galatians of their background with him, his former relationship with them. And he talks about when he first went there. And then he uses, he ends the chapter with an allegory about Abraham and his two sons. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. It'll be several weeks before we're there. This morning, basically, we're just looking at the first seven verses, the contrast between a slave, a minor child, and a full-grown adopted son. Now, Paul is saying, you Galatians, you trusted Christ as Savior. You are saved. You've now been fooled. You've been confused, and you've gone back to a law system thinking somehow that saves you or that keeps you saved. Let me tell you, I see the same thing today. I see there are a lot of people who think that you have to do good works to be saved. They say, well, you can say you talk about believing in Jesus, but you've got to do this and do this and do this. You've got to be willing to do these fallen things. And then there are people who even trust Christ, and they say, yes, salvation is a gift, but how do you live the Christian life? Well, you better do these works and these good deeds, because if you don't do them, you either aren't saved or you lose your salvation. So there are people today that are under the same kind of issues that the Galatians were dealing with. Well, this morning, we're going to look at this. We're going to look at the contrast between a minor child and a full-grown son. Why did Paul talk about that? Well, we're going to see this illustration, and he really shows that the minor son becomes a full-grown son, and that's the contrast between being under law and being under grace. And let me tell you something. You do not want to be under law. There's so many people that, that they just don't understand it. Paul writes later on to the Galatians, and it, it's in chapter, uh, oh, a little bit later on, he says, he says, do you want to be under the law? Do you not listen to the law? That's in verse 21 of Galatians 4. We'll talk about that later. Now, let me give you some background. In that day and time, there was, let's say, a man had a family, and he was a wealthier man, and he had a son who was 11 years old. And while that son was 11 years old, even though one day he would inherit everything from his father, he would be rich, he would be the head of the household, but he's 11 years old. At 11 years old, he was considered a son, but he was treated like a slave. He was called the minor son. And this father had slaves who actually told the son what to do. They would come in. They were called a pedagogies. They were called a tutor, which we saw in the last chapter. They would come in and they'd say, get up. It's time for you to go to school. They would take him to school. They would tell him what to do. The father would tell the slave, tell my son to go study. And that slave would go in there and say, it's time for you to study. So while he was 11 years old, he had to do whatever anybody else told him, even though one day he would be the heir of the whole thing. But then at a certain time, when he was 12 or 13, he became a full-grown son. And what they did is they took the clothes off of him that were clothes of a boy, and they wrapped him in new clothes. And from that point on, he was considered a full-grown son. And the slaves didn't boss him around anymore. Nobody came in and told him to go to school. In fact, he told them what to do. So he moved from being a minor to being a full-grown son. Now, this happened at the age when, set by the father, the son would move from being a minor to being a full-grown son. And he put the clothes of a boy to the clothes of a man. No longer, no longer a slave, but free. 
as a man, as a full-grown son. Now, we've already seen this a little bit because you may realize in your own life that before you put your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior, you were a slave to sin and death. And when you trust in Christ as Savior, He takes you and you become a full-grown son of God. And that's what we're going to see in this passage. Paul talked about it back in chapter 3 when he says, For you were baptized into Christ, you have been clothed with Christ. You put on the new clothes. I want you to think about this. As a minor child, when they became a full-grown son, they put on new clothes. And us, by faith in Jesus Christ, we go from being slaves and minors to full-grown sons of God. This is the example that Paul uses. And he shows that when a person puts themselves under law, whether it's for salvation or for Christian life, they've gone back to be a slave. When one comes to Christ, you're no longer under law. Look what he says. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Paul says, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he's the owner of everything. Now Paul puts it this way. He says, as long as this heir, the one, the little boy, as long as he's a child, he's no different from a slave. I mean, they tell him what to do. Even though he's the owner of everything. See, that little 11-year-old boy owns everything. And yet the slave could come in and say, go, get, go do this. And so he says, as long as the heir, as long as he's a child, he don't, he's no different than a slave, even though he owns everything. And he's going to inherit everything. But he goes on to say, but he's under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. Remember that we said that one day the father would come in and say, now it's time for you to be a full-grown son. And they would change the clothes. He would be a full-grown son. And then those slaves would not come tell him what to do anymore because he's no longer under their authority. And just like the law showed us sin and death and pointed us to Christ, once we trust Christ, the law has no more authority over us. It says, but he's under guardians and managers. One of the words for guardians, uh, one of the words for managers is oikonomos, which means the, the ruler of the house. There was usually a slave that told everybody what to do except the boss, except the main man. It says, until the date set by the father. Now, Paul knows that they know exactly what he's talking about. So then he's going to use the analogy for us. Look what he says. So, also we... So also we, while we were children, that was before we trusted Christ, we were in bondage under the elemental things of the world. That's the law system, the, the rights and wrongs and all that. Listen, but, but we were children. We were minors before salvation, but after salvation, we become full grown. See, we were in bondage. See, what did the law tell us? Anytime you said, I'm going to try to get to God by being good, the law said what? You're not Good. You can't keep it. Anytime a person says, you try to live a good life to get to God, I'm going to try to keep the Ten Commandments. You can't keep them. I'm going to try to do this. You can't do it. I'm going to try to be a good person. You can't do it. The law is your master, and it's over you, and it's sin and death. But the moment you come to realize that you can't keep the law, you trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, as we saw in chapter 3, you now become a full-grown adopted son. And you look at the law and say, you don't, have, you don't boss me around anymore. I'm not under the law. It's beautiful. Look what he says. So also we, when we were children before salvation, we were in bondage under the elemental things of the world. We were in bondage under law. We were in bondage. And when he says we, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Jews always had the Mosaic law, the Gentiles, the pagans and the false gods and all of the, the laws that they had. And before salvation, every one of us were like a minor child under a guardian, the law system working to get to God. But what Happened. Now remember what we said? That it was the time appointed by the Father. Notice this. God's appointed time. Look at verse 4. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under law. At exactly the right time. It's as if God said, Okay, it's time. You're now ready to be full-grown children. So I'm going to send my son 
to deal with all of the issues. And look what he says. But when the fullness of time came, we'd say exactly at the right time. And people talk about when the, the time when Jesus Christ came. And I actually used these two verses at Christmas time because you can make this a, a message about uh, the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Because when the fullness of time came, God sent forth a son at exactly the right time. G God sent Jesus into the world. We call that Christmas. We call that the incarnation. Jesus Christ came and, and was born into this world. God sent forth his son. People say, what do you mean at the right time? Well, it was always the right time. The Old Testament was complete. The law had done its purpose. The Jews were scattered throughout the world. There was one language in Rome and one, one, one way to get the message out. So at exactly the right time, God sent his son. Now, notice what he says, because there's two things. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. Two things. Born of a woman, born under the law. Let's talk about it. Born under a woman. You know what? The born of a woman. That means he became a human being. Something that a lot of people don't think about always. You understand that God the Father is a spirit being. He's always been a spirit. John 4, 24, God is the spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God the Father is a spirit being. God the Holy Spirit is, guess what? A Holy Spirit. He's a spirit being. Jesus Christ, for all eternity, go all the way past, he's a spirit being. And then at a point in time in history, when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to leave the glories of heaven and become a person. The God-man. So Jesus Christ isn't a spirit being anymore. He, now, he's still God. He's the God-man. He's a unique one. The Father is a spirit being. The Holy Spirit is a being, spirit being. But Jesus Christ is a human being. He's perfectly God and perfectly man. Perfect in all the way you could name it. But he is that. And so at exactly the right time, born of a woman, Jesus Christ became a person. John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Philippians 2 says, he left the glories of heaven to become a human being. Now I have to tell you, for God, that's a, that's a pretty big step down to become a human being. But he's the God-man. There's nobody like him. That's why there's only one mediator between God and men. It is the man, Jesus Christ, who's both God and man. That's why he's the mediator. And so at exactly the right time, Jesus became a person. Well, but there's more. There's more. It says that he was born of a woman, but born under the law. Actually, in the Greek, it doesn't say born under the law. It says born under law. Now, he's talking about Jesus did come as a Jew and come under the law system, but uh, the G Mosaic law. But there's a, there's a law out there for whether you're under Mosaic or not. There's the law written in our hearts, which is our conscience. There's all the rights and wrongs. So there's a law system out there that shows people they can't keep it. That's what we talked about several weeks ago. So, here comes Jesus, and exactly the right time, God sent forth his son, Jesus, born of a woman, and we'd say that's when Jesus came into the world, born of the Virgin Mary, and, and then he grew up, and born under law. You know what's amazing? The Mosaic Law has 613 commandments. 613. Jesus Christ kept every commandment perfectly. Nobody's ever done that. Of course, he can do it because he's God. And when he came into this world, he kept the law perfectly. That's why it says he came not to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. And he fulfilled it in two ways. One, he kept it perfectly. Number two, he paid the penalty of the law because the wages of sin is death and he died for us. Now, I want you to see something. And this is what makes this so amazing. That when the exact right time came, God sent forth the son, born of a woman, born in the law, so that, as we look at verse 5, here's the purpose. And there are two things. Notice what he says. So that he might redeem those who were under law, that we might receive, notice carefully, the adoption as sons. Two things. Why did he come? To redeem us and to adopt us. And I want you to see that. Look at this. So that he might redeem those who are under the law, that he might receive the adoption of sons. First, redemption. Redemption means to pay a price. To redeem means to purchase by paying a price. The wages of sin is death. We owed God death. Jesus Christ came down and purchased us, bought us. The word redeem means to buy. If you went to the store and you bought some coffee and you took it up to the deal and you said, I want to buy this coffee, they say $10, you give them $10, you just redeemed it. 
You purchased it by paying a price. Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and purchased every person. He redeemed us. He bought us. In fact, we were in the slave market of sin. And this word actually means to purchase out of the slave market. And we were slaves to sin. Remember? As, a, as the minor, we're slaves. It says we're no different than a slave. We were slaves of sin and death. And Jesus Christ came and said, I'm buying you out of the market. I'm purchasing you you. See, the law is a curse. Curses of everyone who does not do everything written in the law. Jesus Christ came to the earth, became a human being to purchase us. There's an old saying that says this, the birth of Christ brought God to man. The cross of Christ brings man to God. When Jesus was born, that's God coming to man. When Jesus dies on the cross, that's Christ bringing man back to God. But there's a second thing that he did. Not only did he redeem those who were under the law so that he might, we might receive the adoption. Adoption as sons. Now this is one Greek word that means place as a son. It's unusual. It's not used hardly any other places. It was at that culture that you said my son has now become a full grown son. He was called the adopted full grown son. Now, sometimes people would go outside and they would see someone who was an orphan or somebody and they would say, I would like to adopt, I would like, first of all, purchase this boy and adopt him as my full-grown son. They could do that. Sometimes it was the son in the household that when he got that certain age, they were adopted as a son. And so they went from the minor slave under bondage and law to a full-grown son, freedom and heir. And we were minors and slaves under law. And now we're full-grown sons and heirs. In Galatians 3.26, you are sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. We are full-grown sons. So let me tell you something that's unique. We all know the verse, John 1.12. As many as received them, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even those who believe in his name, right? John 1.12. The word for son there, the, the word for children there is a Greek word called technon. It just means a little, a little person, a child. This is not the word that's used here. It says that you might receive the adoption as sons. And this word adopt as sons means a full grown son. It means they changed clothes. We had the clothes of a slave. We were dead in sin. We were destined for the lake of fire. We trusted in Jesus Christ, and he redeems us and changes our clothes, and now we're a full-grown son of God. We've been adopted as sons. That's who we are. We're not just God's children. We're full-grown sons as heirs of God. See, if you're the child... You're not the heir. You're the heir, but you ain't got anything yet. But you're a full-grown son. You've got it all. And he's showing them the contrast. That to go to a law system is the same as going back as a minor and into slavery. And he's saying to the Galatians, you trusted Christ. You have eternal life. You're saved forever. Now you've gone back under a law system. You've gone back like you're a slave and a minor instead of a full-grown son of God. And there are Christians that trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. And as after they trust Christ, somebody confuses them. And they think they're under some kind of law system for, for the Christian life. And what they've done is they've gone and put themselves back under a slavery system rather than a grace system. It happens all the time. Let me tell you what I see. I see out there either... People who are not Christians and people are coming to them saying, if you want to be saved, you must repent of this, do this, turn from this, do this, do this, do this, keep on doing this, and then you could be saved. That's what they told the Galatians, but they were already saved. And then there are people who, when they do trust Christ, they put them on. And I remember one time, this is going to sound bad, but I was laying in the bed, and I said, I wish I'd never heard about this salvation stuff. Because at least I wouldn't be killing myself trying to live a good life now that I'm saved. I didn't understand that the Christian life was a walk of faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. And somebody began later to teach me. And now I moved, I moved from a law system to a grace system. In the same way that I was saved by grace through faith... That's how you live the Christian life, a walk of faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to see it more when we get over to chapter 5. He's going to talk about walking in the Spirit.
It's going to get more details. So to go to a law system is going back as if you're not saved is what it really boils down to. If they go back to the law, and he's telling the Galatians, if you go back to the law, you're acting like children under bondage instead of living like a full-grown son. And then look at verse 6. He says, but you're sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. He says, you're no longer under law, you're sons. And he's given us the Holy Spirit, the spirit of his son, crying out. And what does he cry out? Abba, Father. Listen, you don't need a law system. you got the Spirit. you got the Holy Spirit. That's why when you get to Galatians chapter 6, he'll say, walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says it over and over and over. Man, look, this is something special. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, what? Abba, Father. We get to cry out, Abba, Father. Abba means Daddy. It's an Aramaic word. It means daddy. Now, most of the time when we talk about Abba Father, we always say in things like, we want our little children to go, say Abba, say Abba, say daddy first. I want them to say daddy first. But Abba Father was not what the minor son called his daddy. Abba Father is what the full-grown son called his daddy. Look, it was a term used for the full-grown son to the father. He says, because you're sons, because you're adopted sons of God, you can now cry, what? Abba, Father. Abba, Father. Abba was the term used by the full-grown child. I want you to see something. I want you to hold your place. Put, just hold your place and go to Romans chapter 8. Just a few chapters, few books back in the Bible toward the front to Romans chapter 8. You have to see these verses. So take the time to turn there. You just got to see this. We'll be through in just a second. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 15. Notice what Paul tells the Romans. It's exactly the same thing. Romans 8 verse 15, he says, You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. Why? You're not a slave. But what have you received? You have received a spirit of adoption as sons. Exact same words. By which we cry out, what do we say? Abba. Father, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit, we're children of God, and if we're children, we're heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Jesus Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, so that we might be glorified with Him. Go back to Galatians. Do you hear what He says? He says, you're not a slave, you're a son. And if you put yourself under law, Galatians, or you put yourself under law, any of you in this room, you've gone back like a slave instead of a full-grown son of God. That's who you are. Therefore, look at the summary, therefore, you're no longer a slave, but you're a son. And if a son, an heir through God. See, you're a slave before you're saved. And now you're a son. And the truth is this, when you put yourself under law, you're lacking like a slave. Look at this right here. We're son and heir. We're full grown. We're no longer under law. We're under grace. We're no longer under bondage. We're free. We're no longer a minor. We're a full grown son. We're no longer a slave. We're an heir of God. And if you go under law, you're denying who you are. And you're putting yourself under a slave. We are not under law. When, a, when under a law, a person's living like a slave, a minor like they used to be, instead of living as a son. By faith in Jesus Christ, we are adopted, full-grown sons of God. We're not under the law, either for salvation or the Christian life. We'll get to it later. What have the Galatians done? Listen to this. Chapter 4, verse 9. But now that you've come to know God, or rather be known by God, how is it that you turned back to the weak and worthless things. You observe days and months and seasons and years. He said, what have you done? You've gone back under law. Verse 21 of chapter 